Well, welcome to everybody. Uh, quick introduction. So my, I'm myself, I'm Johannes Hesch. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of BTC Logic. BTC Logic is about 12 years old. This is our third incarnation. Um, uh, we've been actually involved in various GSB activities over the years on numerous occasions. Uh, my partner, Tony McKinsey, he's part of uh, BTC as well. And as you will see with the division of labor, you know, anything that has to do with business, creative, design, those kinds of things, I'll take that. The minute it gets technically a little more sophisticated, I'll punt it over to Tony. And then we also have a third member of the team in the audience, Paul Vitista is all the way in the back there. So we're actually fairly well represented. Uh, a fourth member had a uh, slight accident, so she may or may not come. We'll see if she does come, I'll introduce her. Uh, before we get started, a quick show of hands, you know, and this is strictly self-assessment. On a scale of one to five, one is I kind of sort of know how to turn on my computer. And on the scale of five is, boy, I, when I fall asleep, I you know, come up with assembly language programs in my head. <laughs> and anywhere in between, you know, where, you know, how many ones do we have in the room? Well, actually, I'll start five down. How many fives do we have in the room? So serious techie folks, OK. OK, and then uh, how about fours and threes, sort of pretty advanced? OK, uh, uh, how about twos and ones? OK, so pretty good mix. Uh, what we did is, there's sort of, in the upfront part of the presentation, there's several principles, kind of, we, we approach things top down from a very strategic point of view. Uh, those will be applicable to everybody. A and then we'll bifurcate the presentation a little bit. There'll be a short section for, if you don't really know how to do a, a, a program yourself, uh, here's some canned services you can take advantage of. So the ones and twos will kind of pay attention to that part. And then, uh, again, I'll turn it over to Tony, and he'll go into it now if you, you know, want to, actually get into the hairy end of things and, and program a site yourself. We'll take you through a few slides along those lines as well. Uh, Tony will, that is. And so that's more aimed at the threes and the fours and the fives. And then we'll co converge it again at the end. And hopefully, uh, you will have spent a useful hour. Uh, we'll go at a fairly brisk pace. Uh, if you have urgent questions, by all means, jump up and uh, ask them. But if, on the other hand, we can stay on schedule, that'd be great. Okay. First slide. So we'll talk about seven topics. Uh, and again, our approach very much is top down. You know, think before you cut and you know, measure twice before you cut versus cut, 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 and ooh, I cut too much, and now I have to redo it kind of approach to things. We call it the build it, they will come approach, which is very common in the Silicon Valley. Uh, we try to do it the other way around. So we'll go through what's the purpose of the site, what's the right economics of the site. It's very important that you establish a budget up front. And then we get into how do you actually architect it, designing the look and feel and the behavior of the site, um, composing the content. That's a big deal, especially if you have to uh, uh, B2B marketing, you know, where you, where you try to sell to other businesses. Uh, six is sort of heavily get, gets into the how do you actually build a site, and this, this is where it gets most technical. And then we'll talk a little bit about, okay, now, fine, great, the site is launched. What do you do with it? And this is actually a perfect handoff, if I understand it correctly, for the follow-on section uh, at uh, 2.30 this afternoon. So, okay. Uh, just some important upfront definitions. And some of these we'll re re uh, present again throughout the conversation. Clearly, you ought to have formulated what your company strategy and your product strategy is so that when you put something up there, whether it's a service or it's an actual physical product or it's a software product, you can describe we're in the business of X. And we are you know, producing ABC product, and you know, here's what you can do with it. And it's useful to have that written up and compelled onto a piece of paper as short as possible up front. Uh, same with your target market and the target demographics. It's a big difference whether you're targeting you know, 18, 14, 16-year-olds or 48, 58, 68-year-olds. And a very different uh, uh, definition of the site and different purposes of the site. Uh, the next piece, uh, for those of you that are from the business school, sustainable competitive value prop, or you know, SEA, uh, unfair advantage, there's a whole uh, you know, set of terms that are out there. That is core and center of what we suggest you do, and it's very difficult to get there. It's essentially what is that's unique about your product, and what's unique about your company, what is what keeps you in business and differentiates you from the other folks. I'll go into some more examples later on in the presentation. Getting to a one-liner about the sustainable competitive value prop is extremely difficult. And nevertheless, the methodology hinges on that being crisply formulated. Hopefully, in your earlier parts of the earlier seminars, you have dealt with some of those things. 
Out of that flows content, tone messaging of the site, flows the navigation, what do you present where. Uh, obviously, flows the, the brand identity. Uh, and then you have to do a little practical item, settling on a name. That becomes very difficult. It's funny, it's probably the most inconsequential thing you do. But in our work, and we've worked with entrepreneurial businesses for the last 15 years, picking the logo and picking the name are the two most emotional engagements we ever have. And yet the, their impact on sort of downstream profitability or spark stock price or what have you is zero. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, it's, it's, it's something that uh, people feel quite strongly about. So prepare for that. Uh, one thing that you may want to make sure is, you know, people say, well, we should call it the whatchamacallit company. Well, if whatchamacallit company isn't available as a URL, chances are it's not a good name. So the number of available URLs is much smaller than the set of feasible names. One caution, don't test that. When you go to a register.com or some of these services, and we have some links provided here at the bottom, uh, quite often these things get monitored. And, you know, Harry's software company gets, uh, you know, registered as a, or, or tested whether or not it's available, and then people immediately squat on that name. So do your testing just on Google. Don't test it on the registration sites. And if there's a name that you like, grab it. You know, pay the 30 bucks or whatever it is so that you have it because it gets lost fairly quickly. These days, uh, there's not that many good names around. If necessary, you might have to buy a no domain name. Anyway. There's a few links at the bottom, and then, you know, I think you can, again, in your homework, uh, like I said, we're going pretty gris briskly here, go through that. The second thing to do up front is sort of step back and say, what's the budget for the site? And the budget could be as simple as I'm going to buy, you know, subscribe to a hosting service and I'm going to buy a canned uh, site somewhere and, you know, pay some guy 500 bucks and I'm up and running. If it's a simple resume site, say. If it's a more complicated site like a uh, hosting business or, heaven forbid, you start getting into streaming services or you have heavy documents, uh, say, uh, 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 storage that you, you know, where you want to make documents available to your clientele or to your customers then your hosting fees start going up. It's useful and it's important to go through all those costs up front and figure out how that's being done. Uh, hang on. The, uh, um, um, the other issue ends up being, do you have any sort of e-commerce e plans? And again, if you're planning to do some of that, there's fees involved. Uh, and there's also then generated, you know, generating revenue around the site. You know, work all the economics because that way you can make sure that your planning effort is in sync with sort of the eventual payout of the site and also is obviously not breaking the bank as far as your available budget is concerned. I think all of this stuff is reasonably straightforward. Uh, there's a little bit of stuff on service level requirements uh, that we uh, suggest you get into and uh, also then uh, some help links on what are the kinds of cost buckets that you want to track and you want to make sure that you get a, get a hold of. Most of you guys, I suspect, if you're threes, fours, and fives, this is old hat. But for the ones and twos in the crowd, maybe it's more interesting. Anyway, next slide. Now we start getting into the meat of things. And again, this is sort of in the, this may sound pedantic, but I really, uh, it's a lot cheaper to spend 10 hours up front thinking about this stuff than to spend 40 hours on some code or reprogramming the site because it isn't what you had wanted to. And so the next thing to do is sort of begin the, the more formal architecting task. And this really includes several things. One is it's a sitemap. We'll talk about that later, what that looks like. And you know, it's kind of the na or navigation hierarchy. You might hear those terms. Uh, for each of the pages that you have in that sitemap, clearly identify what is the functionality that I want to have on that page. Is it strictly uh, a static page where I'm just displaying my photo? Or is it a dynamically driven page where I you know, feed up dynamic content, maybe even uh, user contributions and those kinds of things? All of that has later on technical implementation implications that Tony, for example, in his presentation goes in. And then also what we call about services are you know, pieces of software that you're drawing on and that you're leveraging to uh, develop and produce the site, quote unquote, services. And you know, make sure that you identify those. Some of those are available as canned products, and we'll go into some detail later. And some of them you might need to code yourself. It depends. Uh, but it's clear it's important to have that written up up front so that you have a nice statement. So this might look something like, I'm planning a 20-page site. You know, these pages, here's the hierarchy, here's the sitemap, here's how these pages are interlinked with each other. Uh, I need the following components, and it might be a login screen, a, a, a shopping cart, a contact us form, and those are usually uh, canned components that you can 
uh, either purchase or, uh, or acquire through the open source community. And then, you know, I want the following in terms of monitoring a daily report or Google AdWord, uh, I mean AdSense or what have you, uh, Google Analytics, I mean, and, and you have that written up front. This helps both in your own planning as well as if you want to rely on external resources that you can go to them and say, you know, build that. And it's essentially the equivalent of the architect's drawings, not the upfront sketches, but the blueprint drawings that you'll take to the contractor. It's useful to have gone through that. Any questions on that? This is reasonably general, I think, and, and not, too, uh, not too technical yet. Um, let's go to the next page. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh, perfect. I applaud your honesty. Uh, if you go back to those uh, to that page, you, you'll actually next one. You, you'll see uh, both on this page as well as on the previous page. You'll see some links. Uh, for example, some of these hosting providers take you through little budgeting budgeting examples. So Register, I think, has one. GoDaddy has one. And it, and when in doubt, you can always you can Google everything. I mean, I literally I Google car parts. I Google error codes on my, you know, anything you ever want to know, you can Google, and somebody somewhere has put together the content, and so you'll get that as well. And I'm, I guarantee there'll be stuff out there. We, we sort of looked for some links, but we didn't want to overburden you with a ton of links. Okay, okay let's go to the next one. Uh, if you maybe while I'm talking could uh, open up a couple of these examples. Uh, this is sort of uh, now getting into the, into the uh, 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 site map and, and the more detailed definition. So, uh, these are some examples of, of um, sites that we're sending to in terms of, you know, what you, on online resources that are available to help you plan your site. You know, what does a site map look like? What does a navigation hierarchy look like? These are navigation strategies. And it's, it's amazing how when you start diving into this stuff, how religious it gets. Some people, I mean, little things like there's a link. Should that link open up into a new page or should it open up on the same page? Huge philosophical raging debate. I couldn't care less. But it, you know, nevertheless, those are the kinds of things you gotta you gotta get into, and uh, uh, depending on on uh, you know what you believe, um, XML site maps. These are uh, again other examples for that. Tony's just bringing up a few of these, so this gives you a good sense of okay, what is my site gonna look like? What is it gonna behave like? And it starts giving you a sense also on the kind of technical components you wanna look for. Okay, with that, I'll hand it over to Tony. Okay, so one of the ways to really get the most out of your website is to think about the different ways that you want your users to interact with it. So Johannes talked a little bit about some of the components and functionality, but this really you know, distinguishes between having a static site, which is kind of like a business card site, and a more interactive site. And you want your site to be very interactive. Um, um, that's gonna cause your users to come back. Um, um, so you want them to, to return to your site. And so you have to create a memorable experience. And there are literally thousands of different components and pieces of functionality that you could add to create an interactive site. And I'm just going to talk about um, some of the um, most common that you see and you probably all experienced. So the first is authentication. Um, having a, an identity for users to kind of uh, log in screen or sign up. And this is very useful to secure certain areas of your site. Um, if you have a shopping cart uh, where users are going to enter credit card information, or if you have a fee, for, uh, a fee service where they'll access the service from the site, um, you'll need a system there. And there's a lot of um, different options for choosing authentication service. One thing you want to remember though is you want to keep it simple. Um, and as you um, start adding functionality like credit cards, there's be a lot of uh, security and privacy uh, regulations um, and compliances that you'll need to follow. Um, so authentication is a whole big space. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there providing services for this. Um, the second is uh, support. Uh, so the trend right now is to 
um, have user-based support uh, where there's a community of your users helping other users. This is great for um, the website owner because it defers their support costs and kind of and it lets your users help um, each other. But it's also something you have to be careful about. Talking to a lot of um, companies um, recently, particularly some that use like user voice, for example, it's very common in these user-based forums for the users to kind of go anti-company and start griping, and it's very difficult to manage those. So if you're doing it for cost reasons, understand that there is a um, um, there's, there, you're going to have to pay attention and manage it much more than you, than you think, particularly since it's public. Um, if you have a site that is um, going to be accepting data from a user or if you have a lot of content that you want to present in the form of a library or a um, catalog, um, a lot of your shopping sites um, are like this, uh, you're very likely going to want a database. Um, you know, the big databases out there are Oracle, SQL Server, and uh, MySQL, which is um, now part of Oracle. Um, uh, MySQL is the um, open source standard uh, most commonly used, and uh, SQL Server is the most widely used worldwide. Um, blogging is another great thing to have on a site. Um, if you're willing to commit to the time and resources to keep it up to date, it's very easy to implement. Um, but you don't want it to go stale. There's a lot of blogs out there that, you know, where the author hasn't posted in, you know, six weeks, six months, six years. Um, you really need to start contributing to a blog every week. Uh, we try to do um, six to 12 articles a week on our own blog. Um, and it's really difficult to, to try to, you know, get that following. But once you do, you want to keep them there. And um, you'll have a lot of repeat users come and users contributing to the blog. Um, you know, I think it really depends on the site and, the, and, and how much time you're willing to put into it and how much you're getting from it. So one great thing about a blog is once you kind of create this community, uh, you'll have other bloggers start linking to your site. So as you post an article, another blogger will, will um, comment on it. And, and that kind of creates a momentum and it will drive traffic. So when we um, don't blog for a while, we see our traffic start to dip a little bit. Um, and um, we, we'll blog, and then we'll get other people linking to our blogs, um, or cause an increase in our traffic. How frequently do you recommend blogging? Again, I think it, it's all um, based on your user base, you know, how many people you have using coming to the site, um, and where you want to be. If you're happy where you're at, um, uh, you probably don't need to, to blog a lot, but if you're trying to build that user base and make it create a presence, um, the more the better. I mean, it really, um, is a way for you as a website owner to engage with your customers um, or potential customers versus you know sites sites that are static that have the same information. What about your earlier point about um, customer customer service and support? Yep. If you didn't want to do the community route and you said we need more of a hand on deck with people, your customer support could be a good way to spread. Uh, there's a lot of services. Um, Zendesk is one. Um, you know these are services where you simply cut or paste a line of code into a website, and it provides a um, support interface um, so users can submit questions. And then usually they have a back-end portal that you could go into to, to respond to those questions and it manages it. Um, yeah, I'm currently working on a little startup that tries to solve that problem. Um, um, it's a good example. I think a lot of things I'm going to talk about in the presentation um, or from my own experiences of you know of working on this site, and I've been working on it for nine months, and you know it's one of those things when you start, you think it's going to take six months, and then uh, you know it ends up it'll probably be a year before we go live. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, analytics. Uh, so I'm sure everybody's heard of Google Analytics. If you hadn't, it's a great free service. Um, simply cut and paste a line of code onto your website. You know, it'll give you all sorts of statistics about um, where your customers are coming from, who they are, um, about their operating system, um, what pages they're visiting, um, when they leave your site. So it, it's a fantastic tool. Um, you, of course, you're sharing your data with Google, but I don't think that's anything to be afraid of. They're going to um, learn about you anyway, and uh, they're really going to help you know, promote your service. So you know, uh, work with them. 
Um, but you'll really find out you know, what areas of your sites are working, what areas of your sites are not. Um, analytics are really important in things like sign-up workflows. So um, um, in my previous company, um, uh, we had, um, I guess, a sign-up workflow, like five pages, and everybody was dropping out on a certain page. Uh, so we hooked up to anal analytics to understand why people were dropping out, and uh, once we discovered the root cause, we made a change, and we almost doubled our sales um, uh, just by you know, making a simple change that didn't take people away from our sign-up flow. So analytics is, you know, that's the engine that kind of help you, helps you with that. And then last but not least is e-commerce. Um, it's a lot of shopping cart functionality out there. Um, um, if you go to Amazon, and they'll let you sell your products and services on, on the Amazon site or eBay. Um, if you're going to host your own um, shopping experience, um, there's a lot of services like PayPal that will provide the uh, fulfillment of, of, the, of the data. Um, and of and last but not least is, well actually, let me jump to the um, uh, selection of these technologies. So um, as you choose these technologies, there's a lot of things to think about. Uh, first, I would look at off-the-shelf or web services. So um, Facebook is, the, I mean, they're at the crossroads right now and kind of, you know, as, as where they are at a company. You know, there's a lot of people think that, um, you know, they're just going to take off and be the new king of the web. I think they just recently passed Google as far as number of search hits in, um, um, or tra web traffic. You know, it's the first time anybody's passed Google in like six years. Um, but on the other side, you know, they've, um, I think new user signups have dropped like 60 to 70 percent over the last two months because of the privacy concerns. So, um, you know, they're they are launching a lot of new services where, um, you know, you log into a site. Um, um, if the site shares that information with Facebook, then, um, um, you know, you could get ads or, or um, um, Facebook can look at, um, at other users who've used that site and give you recommendations or you know comments that you know maybe your friends have made at the same site, um, but a lot of people are really turned off about that um, because of the privacy issues and concerns. Um, so it's easy to m implement, um, but you know one of the things I think you really need to do is when you create a site is is think about your user base and you know is it worth it uh, when you implement something like a Facebook or Twitter. Now other sites are very social in nature and and that's fine, um, but if you're doing something that's a little bit more private, then you want to. Um, um, just exercise a little bit of caution there. So for the most part, you're still in a situation where you have to deal with um, a lot of the compliance issues. So the big one is um, PCI compliance. So it's a payment card um, industry. And they have a document that's literally 150 pages, and you could download that. Um, but anybody who's going to accept credit cards from Visa and MasterCard have to apply to the rules um, in, in this document. And it includes everything from having like fingerprint scanners at your, um, where your data is stored to um, um, you know, um, encrypting sites and having different file permissions um, on your on your server. So the document's very straightforward. And typically, what you do when you launch an e-commerce service, you you kind of go through the checklist, and then um, um, different levels of of rules will apply to you. Um, some some companies need to be audited. So you know, every quarter, um, an auditing company will come in, just like um, like an Ernest and Young, I guess, and 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 look at your security and your infrastructure and walk your data center and see how it is. If you have smaller transactions, um, usually you just fill out the form, and then um, you know if, if like Visa or Mastercard wants to you know talk to you about your security, um, then you'll um, you know show them that that you've done that. You said that's true even if you're using third party like PayPal or Google. Can that actually fix the credit card? It could be true. So um, PayPal offers different services. So some of the services will require you to um, um, to do that. So if you're just using PayPal APIs and you're, um, you're actually collecting the information on your website and then send it to PayPal. But you've seen those links where you click and then you open up to the PayPal site. 
Um, at that point, usually PayPal is, is handling all the PCI compliance. So, but there's a lot, to, there's a lot of information there. And usually pay, PayPal does a really good job of explaining the different options and what you have to do or do to, to, to use these services. Uh, there's a lot of different solutions out there. Um, Authorize.net is another big one. Um, you know, there's really two payment services fall into two categories. There's um, third-party providers like PayPal. So to use PayPal and accept PayPal payments, you don't need to fill out a credit application and um, receive a merchant account. You know, they're acting as the merchant um, for you. If you use something like Authorize.net, um, which is a gateway service to um, like Visa, MasterCard, American Express. So if you're gonna accept credit card payments, um, they'll move the transaction for you, um, but you need to apply to, all, you, know, you need to um, be compliant with all the rules that um, are stated in the PCI document. Um, um, OpenID is the open source one. So there's kind of a movement on the web to um, get more companies using OpenID. Uh, I think everybody remembers um, Microsoft Passport uh, was another similar um, one. Um, Amazon, uh, so your Amazon login is, could be used on um, other websites to pay um, and you'll use the Amazon payment infrastructure. Uh, so there's a lot of options out there. Um, a lot of people create their own. Um, there's a lot of guidelines and a lot of software packages um, out there um, have um, all the necessary um, technology to, to, to make sure it's a secure connection on your website and that the user is authenticated as they use. Um, you, there, there's packages out there for different levels. So it all depends on what you need. Um, you know, it's... Now, if, if you're doing banking, for example, there's a sort of whole, whole lot of rules you need to do, um, like long password. Um, I, I guess it really depends on what type of problem you're trying to solve. Um, um, Amazon, for example, is fine with using your email address as the username. There's other sites where that's a big no-no. So there's a lot of different philosophies out there and a lot of different approaches. Um, you know, I think it's really important to keep it simple. Um, um, you know, logins prevent users from, from continuing on to their next task often. So wherever you put a login in, uh, you're going to get some sort of drop off. And whether it's, it's people just don't want to deal with it or they don't want to create a login or they can't remember their password, um, particularly sites that require you to make really complicated passwords, um, you know, nobody seems to really remember those. And um, so that causes a drop off in um, what you're trying to accomplish with the user. I, I, well, so um, you know, one thing you want to do is don't store the information on your servers. So by using one of these providers, you know, the credit card information and everything is stored on PayPal or an authorized.net server. So that really, um, um, you'll have less requirements um, to, um, to worry about. Okay, I'm going to um, talk a little bit of, about things to think about as you're choosing these technologies. Um, you know, so there's a lot of solutions out there um, for ease of use and implementation. I uh, really suggest that you look at what's available and use something that's off the shelf. Um, you know, something like a PayPal or Authorize.net has thought through a lot of the issues and relieves the burden from you having to, to understand that and build it yourself. Um, think about the um, platform that you're going to build. If, you know, if you're going to do something on, with e-commerce and have a blog and um, have some support components, 
um, you know, some of the tools you might want to use might only work on a Windows server or a Linux server. So, so um, you want to make sure that you're, you understand your technology requirements and choose the tools that are going to work for your platform. Most of the common tools will work on any um, platform. And if it's a SaaS service, web-based, then uh, um, that's going to work as well on, on the other platforms. Um, the last thing you want to think about is choosing your um, hosting. Um, you know, I think it all depends on your business, how many transactions you're trying to do. Um, my own personal preference, because I'm building, I guess this last week's built um, um, a payment platform. Um, I'm using PayPal um, APIs, so I'm controlling the user experience. I didn't want to go to the PayPal website. Um, um, but behind the scenes, I'm just communicating with the PayPal websites. So um, it's really up to what you're trying to accomplish. Some users that um, you know, are quite happy with like an eBay site where they're just going to put a link and you click here and they get paid. Um, another thing to think about, and you know, this is where I'm struggling a little bit myself, is, is the back end accounting. I mean, um, so at the end of the day, you have to do your financial reports. Um, and when you're using a, a third party provider, is it going to download into a product like a QuickBooks or are you going to keep track of which customer paid? Um, if it's like a recurring subscription, you know, if a credit card doesn't process, um, you know, is that merchant going to go and, and, and uh, contact the customer or try to resolve the, the problem? Or are you going to have to get notified of that and, and, and chase down the user's payment? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, um, different hosting options. Um, but there are limitations based on what you're doing. If you're in a shared environment, then um, um, you might not be able to install the software, the packages that you want to use. Um, as you get to dedicated or virtual servers, then um, uh, you can do whatever you want on, on your system. Are, are you done? Or? Oh, yeah. That was. Uh, just to keep you guys awake, we're switching the microphone back and forth. Perfect. All right, I'm going to pick it up a little bit so that we don't run out of time. Uh, there will be. For you, three, fourth, and five, there will be one more sec technical section, full six pages of it, so you'll get your fill. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. So you've kind of done, wrote down all your top-down purpose statements, gone through the site economics, how much is it going to cost me, what's my budget, you know, what are the hosting fees, and then if it's an e-commerce site, how much do I expect to make after the thing? And uh, you've also sort of sat down and done the architecting a little bit. And uh, you know, have a pretty good sense for technically how you, you think you're going to implement it. So all of this is all still part of the planning stage. Now we're starting to shift a little bit gears into actually sort of committing uh, words on paper that actually describe what the site will be. And again, step back up. It's easy to sort of dive down into the technology in the bits and bytes and start building this thing and noodling on it. But then you know, do you really know what you're building? Uh, this is sort of. Uh, I don't know, 12 years of wisdom condensed into one page. And uh, so let me try it on you. Uh, you might remember from the beginning, we talked about sustainable competitive value prop. What's your unique value proposition? You know, why are people going to come to you? And uh, a little bit later on, we'll talk about the difference between a category and a competitive value prop. It's important to have your competitive value prop clear, meaning why am I different from the other solutions in my space? And not just clear as in you know, one full page written down, but clear as in a pithy one-liner. And to me, the acid test is always you walk to somebody in the bar, you have a conversation, they go, hey, you know, Ward, what do you do? And you have your one sentence. And if they don't say, oh, cool, you're not <laughs> there yet. You know? And so uh, this is very important. And getting there is really difficult. It's not an easy thing. It's difficult strategically because a lot of businesses think they're unique, but they really aren't. And then even if they are, committing that to words and uh, expressing that in some sort of a compelling way is not trivial. But you know, the key then is how do you translate that into a user interaction? That's really the navigation functionality. We talked about that. It's content and nomenclature. What are the terms on your site? What are the words you're using? How many do you use? And by the way, less is always better than more. Um, what's the design look and feel? That's your target demographic. Am I selling to you know 14-year-old teeny boppers or selling 
to you know aging baby boomers like myself, and you know we have uh, different uh, expectations and different style expectations and so forth. Is it a B two B site? Is it a B two C site? Very different. In our case, you know uh, uh, we try to do design, but if we come out and sort of be all you know hip and with a beret in my hair and a gola cigarette and so forth. People don't go for that because our clients tend to be state businesses and they don't want some, you know, uh, dot com guy. They want a guy that knows what he's doing and, and, and delivers success. And so every business has a different demographic that they're targeting and the design look and feel and the terminology that they're using has to match that. Um, this is the first, and uh, there's actually a fair amount of thinking behind this in terms of what is the economic benefit and we wrote whole articles on, you know, what is the economic benefit of design. Uh, Two of them, the two are basically, A, if your value proposition is clearly expressed. Secondly, and this is something that's often forgotten, how do you sell this, use the site in a sales situation? You know, you're trying to acquire customers, you're trying to acquire investors, whoever. You know, think through, it's, it's like a movie. You know, we come up here, you know, we introduce ourselves, we, you know, put on the microphone, we turn on the computer, we take you through five slides, we shut the computer down, we go home. That was the show. And you will present a similar show to your customers or to your investors when they see you the first time. What is that show? What is that experience? And can you actually sort of give them some eye candy along the way? Do you make it easy to understand? You know, do they really consume that show in such a way where at the end they're back to the you know, reaction to Ward's pitch in the bar where they go, oh cool, I want to do business with these guys. And so also think through, you know, is there eye candy on the site? And do I have an easy, for example, to you know, easy access to a demo if I want to demo a product and how easy to use it is, for example. Uh, and then less is always more, traditional minimalism. It is so much harder to say, as you can tell from the fact that we're already behind schedule, it's so much harder to say things with fewer words than it is to say it with many words. And uh, even though we don't necessarily practice it right now, traditional minimalism is the name of the game. And I would invest the extra time to just get it down to the poetic minimum. Uh, it's so much better for comprehension. Yeah. Uh, let me take you through an example. Actually, I'll just click slowly. Yeah, click the next one. This is a case example. Uh, this was a uh, uh, biotech site. They had an informational services. You could look up compounds and uh, uh, sort of various research results. Actually, if you go back, we'll go back now. Uh, 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 and their target demographic was pharmaceutical companies. If you know a little bit about the pharmaceutical industry, uh, it's, a, it's a hit business. It's just like the rock and roll business or uh, some of the other or movie businesses where whoever comes out first pretty much gets 80% of the industry revenue and 80% of the industry profits. Very little is given to second comers. And so this is all about time to market races. Now these time to market races typically are about somewhere around eight to 10 years long because by the time you go through all the development cycles and so forth, uh, it's a huge deal. And so the value proposition for this company, and this took a fair amount of customer research to come up with that, was, you know, we're going to help you accelerate your time to market, which everybody in those pharma companies knew is worth literally a billion. I'm not kidding. The difference between first and second is a billion dollars. And so, you know, that led to this. This is obviously a schematic. It's not a fully designed site. That led to this notion of winner takes all. And again, it's a, it's a customer benefits oriented statement. It's not, let me tell you about me. It's, we understand what your issues are when it takes off. And then, you, you know, when people got onto the site and they rolled over, it, you know, it, they ran into these statements, whoever finds the cure first to know how to find, one has to know how to search. And that was essentially the introduction to their search service and the fact that if you deploy their search service, it helped the pharmaceutical companies accelerate their time to market. And then the rest was really simple. And, and one of the reasons we're throwing this up here as well is, is so kind of the left-hand side of the page, if you will, is a bit of an illustration of this notion of a clear competitive value prop and expressed in a sort of fair amount of poetic simplicity. And then on the right hand side, in order to say what you need to say about your company, it's not a lot is needed. There's sort of standard components. Who are we? What's our product? You know, who are our customers if we have any? Everybody always wants to know, you know, who else has kind of drunk the Kool-Aid? Nobody, nobody wants to be the first. You know, a uh, little bit about us in the news and and contact us, and then maybe if you want to get into blogging or Facebook and those things, you can stick that on there. And that's, that's by and large, most people's marketing site. Yeah. Next one. Uh, sorry. Oh, yes. This is the, uh, the other half now. I talked a little bit about sort of the design, the overall purpose of the site, 
and, and doing the heavy thinking in terms of clarifying the mission and getting it tight. And by the way, I heavily encourage that you get constant feedback. Talk to your friends, and the more critical, the better. Uh, talk to potential customers. We all are convinced, you know, there's, uh, most of you have taken the classes about, you know, what is it, the internal bias that you overestimate your own chances of success? And so, of course, we, you know, my startup is going to be winning, right? Well, statistically, you got about a 1 in 20 chance of succeeding, so how do you make sure that you get that up to 1 in 3, 1 in 2? And the way to do that is collect early feedback, lots of feedback, and get to that point where it's really simple, simple and it connects. And one of the things is, is, this is what I talked about earlier, the category value prop versus the competitive value prop. I don't know how many sites, and we go to a lot of clients, we come in and they go, well, we do you know, such and such and such, and it helps you do this. Well, you and 20 other guys, you know, it's like coffee. Uh, my coffee wakes you up in the morning, big whoop de doo so does everybody else's coffee. However, if you come out and say, I'm Pete's and I'm better than Starbucks because with us you get the darker roast and if you want to have your teeth curled back in the morning when you drink your coffee, we're the brand. <laughs> now I know why you're different. I may not like it, but at least I know where you're at. And this requires A, a clear self-awareness of what the difference is between us and the competition and B, like I said, sort of the poetic simplicity to express that. Secondly, again, despite my uh, verbosity here, try to use simple English. I hate these sites where it's going, you know, we've been in the tech business for 20 plus years, and you know, when the reverse double hel helix modulator connects with the, and people go, I don't know what that means, especially when you get to a new customer. You know, new customers, uh, by the way, does anybody know why steam engines had Corinthian columns? This is great. So go back to 1820, whenever the steam engine was invented. And this was the high-tech device of its time, right? No horses, no slaves. I mean, this thing's like turning by itself. And people did, it didn't make sense. And for most people, they have a hard time connecting with what's fundamentally new. We all do. You, know, you always anchor on what you know, and then you kind of iterate from there mentally. And so they put Corinthian columns to next, to next to it. Why? Because that's what, that's what made it approachable. People could kind of, oh, I get the columns. And now what are all these dials behind it? You know, oh, well, that's actually the steam engine, but never mind that. You know? And so it's somewhat the same here. You know, you have to give people an anchor, a bridge to what you're offering and why it's unique and new. And if it's not unique and new, by the way, you may want to think through a new business plan, but let's assume it's unique and new. And, but then what is the anchor? What's my Corinthian column with whom in which I can bring the customer in, say it's like X, but only different, and here's why we're different. And you know, express that in, in, in plain English. And, uh, Contrast that to your major competitor. We always, one of the things we do do is we take every competitor in the space, we print out their key pages about us, home page and so forth, hang them up on a wall, and then very quickly you can see what the various positioning is and what, how they're messaging and how they're presenting themselves. And then you put yourself to the you know, left or right of it and you can say, am I different? And am I compellingly different? And is the presentation better? And is the, you know, the, the content better? Last item, so let's assume you've done this and you have, and I'd use us as an example of, uh, 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 as, as, as sort of the guinea pig here. In our, you know, you, you, you've done all the thinking, you talked to your friends, you hung out with your wife or girlfriend or whoever, and sat at the uh, dinner table and you kind of got it all defined to a fine home point. This is our sustainable competitive value prop. And now you gotta translate that into a one page, a one sentence statement where the guy you know, in the bar says, oh, cool. Now, this isn't necessary, it doesn't pass the cool test, but it's sort of clinically accurate. The work that we do is increasing your likelihood of investment success. If you're sitting here and you have $100,000 million $100, or half a million dollars to burn, and you want to launch a new company, you, know, you have a 10% chance of success. If you bring somebody like us in, you have a 30% chance of success. It's not guaranteed, but it's better. That's what we live off of. And so, in your case, you gotta get that strategic tagline. This is kind of an inventory of marketing collateral that I have to write. Write down that one page tagline. Second one is have your benefit statement. The third one is talk a little bit about your technology. You know, here's my one liner. Here's why this is good for you. Here's how I'm doing, my secret sauce. What, what, am, what am I going to battle with that allows me to achieve these benefits that you're subscribing to? Next one. 
clearly hit them over the head with, and here's why this is better than the competition. You know, it's the darker rows, or those kinds of things. And then, then you finally get into the volume of the final collateral, you know, whatever you might have, uh, print collateral, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, the, 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 the sim one pager and so forth. Actually, one other thing, there was a gentleman that asked earlier about blogs and Facebook and all these things. Um, most new companies start out life being unknown, by definition, and then the, the, the game becomes how do I become known. And uh, these days, uh, things like Facebook and blogs are basically online collateral. It's very rare that they drive traffic. So just in terms of uh, managing expectations. But you have to have them. So it's like if you have a job search, you gotta have a Facebook page, and by the way, better have two Facebook pages, your personal one and the one that the recruiter sees. And the same with a LinkedIn page, and same with uh, maybe a Twitter if you, you know, do that. Even though when I asked my 18-year-old daughter what she thought of uh, Twitter, she said it's for baby boomers, they wanna be cool. So I don't know, uh, you tell me, but whatever. These days you have to have it. And, and so th those are the kinds of pieces of collateral you have to put together. But do it after all those other pieces. <coughs> All right, I'll turn it back to, uh, oh, and this was the compliance stuff that Tony talked about earlier. Uh, so, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I took his mic. Yeah, I just wanted to also comment on, you know, there's a lot of strategies on, on figuring out which page design works well. Um, you know, a lot of companies will have, you know, A-B testing. So they'll test two different variations of the page and they'll track with the analytics, you know, which page leads to higher conversion rates or not. And, you know, and, and sites are really, um, I mean, they're constantly changing their dynamics. So um, don't be afraid. You don't want to search for the perfect solution because you'll, you'll spend all your time um, trying to design it. You want to get something out, test it, uh, monitor it, um, and then make iterative changes to it. Um, and over time, you know, you'll build your presence and, and, and narrow down the page that, that works best for your site. So we talked a little bit about uh, some of the search engine optimization. There's a lot of techniques. Um, um, you know, Google can send a lot of traffic to your site, so it's a good good thing to look at. I think that's one of your okay, well, websites. Uh, okay. no is this a good website? Is that talking to the moment? <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, if you know if there's nothing out there now like it, 
um, you know, it's probably a good business opportunity because you could be the first to kind of, um, if um, there's a lot of um, open source technology, particularly, you know, community based or, um, or geared towards social networking. Um, Um, yeah, I say, I say largely. Um, you know, you always want to be looking for a different approach to distinguish yourself. So, so if that's going to give you further traction, um, you know, I would definitely promote that and uh, yeah, and use that as your distinguishing feature. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, you know. Um, as Johanna said, you know, you know, there's almost an expectation. You know, since Facebook is out there and and uh, Twitter, you, you want to be there. Um, I think for most businesses, unless it really doesn't make sense, um, but it's just um, it's awareness. Um, you know, if you're doing a job search, people are going to look for you on LinkedIn. So, so you know, you know, five years ago that wasn't the case. So, so there's a lot of um, a lot of these social sites that are kind of um, developing that that you you want typically you want your presence there. Um, if you were not super tech savvy, so maybe one, two, three. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll dive into the slide. I talk a little bit about kind of the options here. So you know, you know, we talked a lot about the importance of defining your requirements, understanding what functionality your site's going to have to have, um, understanding your strategic advantage, and how you're going to message that on the site. Um, so now you kind of get to the point where you're ready to um, you know make this site a reality. And there's really you know there's a lot of different approaches and hybrids, but it's really you're either going to look for a service that provides this functionality for you. Or you're going to try to um, build it yourself and, and, and put it together. So um, for many sites, particularly marketing-oriented sites, you're just going to promote your business, but, but you're not doing a lot of, um, um, it's not a SaaS service. Um, uh, it's like a consulting business is a good example. Um, a, a lot of the um, homestead sites or um, portal software technologies um, are uh, the best place to start. And you know, you can have a website up and running in a few minutes and it's going to cost you $10 a month. Um, you won't be able to, um, you'll be limited on what you can do, but you're never really interacting with the web server. You go to a UI where you say, I'd like my site to look like this. And they'll kind of walk you through a wizard and you could control the navigation. Um, you could add things like a blog, typically. So a lot of the open source software, because a lot of these people are using open source in the back end. Yeah, yeah. But one of, I think one of the issues certainly that I'm having, and maybe other people is, I don't know what the, I can sort of articulate it in my mind, like, okay, I'm going to build an Excel sheet. And so the drag and drop feature, is that something where there is an on the shelf component of that? Yep. Know what to look for? Yep, yep. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the technologies that, that will provide that um, coming up here in a second. Um, and I'll talk about that one specifically. Um, but, you know, I would encourage anybody who has, um, who just wants a site for their business, um, it's not an online business where you're providing a service online. It's, it's, to, it's to look at the um, one of the services or the template sites that are out there. Um, um, if you decide to code it yourself, um, you know you could hire a team, try to do it yourself, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that, that go into that. Um, but there's a lot to, to cover. So um, one of the things you want to do is is you know, really understand you know, different technologies and languages on the web. Um, and you know, Google's your friend. There's a lot of different resources. Um, WC3 is kind of the, cons um, the consortium that, that oversees the specifications for HTML and how it works. And you know, they play an important role because you have everybody with different browsers. You have your mobile browsers, your Safaris, your IEs, your Firefoxes. 
And when they read an HTML page, you know, you all want them to behave the same way. So, so everybody kind of looks at the WC3 spec to, um, to guide them on, you know, what, um, what, how code should behave. Um, you also have a lot of other websites. One I particularly like is Killer Sites um, down below that um, just has a lot of topics for how to do different things. So if, you, so if you're looking how to, to do something like a navigation or a drag and drop, um, there are plenty of how-to sites um, that will show you how to do it. And you know, most things are probably um, easier than you would expect if, once you find the right resource. And I, what I usually do is um, um, you know, look at three or four and um, you know, look at the user's feedback and then comments and then try a few things out. Uh, and then there's some other solutions um, I'll talk about next. Um, Yeah, let's go to 14. Um, oh, actually, back on 13. There's one comment I wanted to make about uh, when, you're, when you're making that decision of buying or um, to use a canned service or, or building it yourself and, and hiring someone to, to build it for you. Um, I think one of the things that I've seen is people really underinvest in their website. Um, you know, they might have a you know hundred thousand, two million dollar, four million dollar business. And then they'll invest like, you know, five hundred dollars on their website, and um, you know, a website can be one of the most important marketing tools um, that you have, generate a lot of revenue. So, um, you know, you know, some sites, you know, a thousand dollars to design a really nice site, you could get now pretty much on the market. Um, if you want deeper functionality, you know, ten, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars, but with the value you get from a website, you know, um, that's actually I think fairly small. I think it's actually one of the cheaper ways to. Uh, to drive traffic in business um, if done right and if it makes sense for your business. For a $1,000 site, would that be a good time to You know, there are so many options. There's obviously that. Um, um, I've seen some really nice, um, you know, there's, there are template sites, but um, these are companies that have created thousands of sites for you to choose from. And then what they'll do is they'll go in and they'll customize it for you. Um, you know, we have the RIA website is a good example of that. Um, um, it's a little service that we played with. Um, somebody comes in and you know, uh, these are pre-canned sites that you would go in and say, I want it to do this, 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 add this functionality. And so it's already, you know, a lot of the hard work's already done and it's just customization that the company is doing for you. Did you already talk about domains? Um, we talked a little bit about domains. Did you have a specific question? Or? So on uh, 14, um, so we talked a little bit about choosing Linux or Windows. Um, I personally don't think that um, one is better than the other. It all depends on, on your need and what components you're going to be using. Um, some of the things to think about, though, is and if you're going to scale up, a lot of people usually go to Linux because um, the more servers you have, um, the less the licensing costs. But there is a lot of hidden costs with Linux. Um, so you know, it's almost a wash at the end of the day. Um, um, when you choose a platform, um, you know, often it, it will come with a web server. Um, Apache and IIS are, are the most commonly used. Uh, Tomcat is when you start getting into Java pages, and so it gets a little bit more technical. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the, the application languages. So there's really, I think, four classifications of languages to use. And this is just a one minute overview that just to kind of um, give you some background as you, as you talk to people. So you have your markup languages. So this is your HTML, your style sheets. So these are um, pages that are just read by a browser and, and, and display your content. Um, then you have this concept of server applications. So a server application adds business logic to your website. And all that processing is done on the server. Um, so this is where you have your PHP. If you ever notice, you go to some websites that have a PHP extension, at the end of the file name. Um, your Code Fusion, your Java, your um, ASP.x. Um, these are all languages that are done on the, on the server. And, you know, and the server technology is very powerful, um, but now you're getting into um, a lot of programming and business logic. Um, and I think um, you know, it's always going to be around, but what you're see starting to see more and more is people relying on scripting languages. So the difference between a, um, an application language and a scripting language is a scripting language 
runs on the device that's calling up the web page. So that's your own computer and your browser. So JavaScript is a good example of that, um, HTML5. And um, I think as we start talking about Web 3.0 and you're hearing about HTML5 a lot right now, um, you're going to see more people doing the, um, the processing, um, um, any sort of business logic or um, 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 additional computation on the client's computer that's doing the request as opposed to the server that does it and sends it. So it's just distributing the computing a little bit more. Um, more, more, more often than not, that someone has already built it. Um, um, open source is a huge mo movement, um, particularly on the Linux platform. Um, so I would look there first. Um, there's some dangers with open source. So um, I'll give you a good example. So you know, Twitter had tremendous problems scaling their service because it was so successful, and, th and they were built on uh, Ruby on Rails. So you know, they were kind of the first to go you know, that far with, with Ruby on Rails. And they ran into a lot of issues and had to, um, you know, it cost them a lot of money and a lot of time and they had a lot of downtime and, and re-architecting the whole site. But you know, at that point, if your site's that successful, that's a good problem to have. But if you're using some of the open source technologies, they change a lot. Um, if, if something goes up on a big scale like that, you, you, know, you might be you know, the first to kind of go into a certain area. Um, then there's always the, um, um, the, plat the, soft the software you could license, so your SQL servers and uh, like your Cold Fusion and, and such. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I think you're right. It's, it's um, the point I want to make is is you get out there a little bit too far, cutting edge, and then you're going to be dealing with issues that haven't been dealt with before, and um, um, you know often that's I think you know that's a good thing in a lot of perspectives. Um, uh, you push the envelope. Um, you get a lot of business. You get a lot of traffic. Uh, but sometimes you're building for um, either um, um, you know it's not the, the technology. And I think there's a lot of technology debates. What technology should, should we do to that? But at the end of the day, if it's a business website, um, you know, what's going to make or break the company is um, a lot is you know the business decision, your strategy, and the message you're communicating. So this question, from a business perspective, from a business perspective, uh, we're 100% focused. There's nothing to do with the fact that there's a quality Yeah. But um, the value we get is the open source software. Mm-hmm. I wish I had the website. There's uh, a lot of websites you could go out there and you could see like what technology um, you know people who are looking for jobs or experience or skills people have. So you actually do see a lot of engineers go towards the, the newer technologies because um, it's new, it's interesting. Um, um, you know, Java, um, C++, you know, are you know by far and large the you know the, the largest technologies um, developers understand these. Yeah, if you Googled it, um, you could see, um, and it does a pretty good job. It's been tracking it for years, so you could kind of see the increase and decrease, and you get a good sense. Um, Odesk, I think, is another um, website that does um, outsourcing. Um, they show you some kind of just like 
um, you know, people submit jobs and then people apply for those jobs. And you get a good sense of, you know, 80% uh, of the jobs up here are, you know, um, you know um, for Java or, you know, so you get a good sense of, of what's in use. Um, let me see. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was, as far as these technologies, were, the, were client add-ons. So you hear about Flash, you hear about Silverlight. So, so, um, so these are technologies that um, Adobe Microsoft put out that allow um, um, services that they provide to run on any platform, but they usually require a user to download a client, uh, like a Flash file. And you all see like, you know, what Flash sites look like on the iPhone. Um, you know, I personally tend to stay away from those um, if I could avoid it. Um, um, but if there's a good reason to use one, um, you know, Flash is, is widely adopted. So. Mm -hmm. that, that he lives in that world. Um, other people live in the open source world, and the tools today are like so powerful that we could do whatever we wanted using either one, but just having found this one guy, like that solved my problem. Yeah. And yeah. worrying about the technical issues was something that really got outweighed by, by that. Yeah, I worked um, for 16 years at Intuit, and you know, if there's three things I, I learned, it's it's um, good people. Um, a good product strategy out trumps technology. And, you know, and I was um, a development manager. And you get in these technology debates. What's the right one, right one? Now, technology is moving. And you know, um, I almost think it's disposable. You, know, you use it to get a job done. You go on to, to, to what's next. And, um, but you know, it, there are holy war debates about you know, whether it should be winter, whether it should be this, whether it should be that. And um, you know, most of the time, those take you off from where you really need to be focusing. But I, I absolutely agree, you know, a good person um, who's reliable um, um, and isn't biased um, will take you a lot further than. Um, let me see, 16. Oh, hosting. Um, so I just quickly wanted to, to um, leave you with some final thoughts about hosting. Um, so if you build it yourself, you're going to host. There's really three or four kind of things you need to think about. So one is a shared platform. So you just GoDaddy, everybody offers a shared platform, but essentially your website is on a single computer with many other websites. And there's limitations on what you can do. You usually can't get to the operating system. Um, you could install what they allow you to stall, install, and they'll do it for you. Um, but you know, these, these um, providers usually, you, know, you could get them for $5 a month up to about $50 a month. Um, the next level is you need your own kind of um, system. And usually what people do is they go to a VPS. So um, it's a virtual private server where um, you have your own operating installed on something like a um, VMware image. And um, your website runs on another server, or on a server with maybe four or five other websites, but you're all separated and running in different images. Um, then you go up to dedicated servers when you have a lot of volume and traffic. Um, or you really need security and, and that isolation. Um, and then where, you know, when you hear about cloud computing is, is where this concept of a server is, is, is less vague and, and you're, um, you're really deploying instances of these images and necessarily you don't care about servers and where they're at and where they're hosted and you're paying for um, the resources that you're using, how many instances you have running, how many CPUs you have running, and um, so Amazon um, Web Services, Microsoft Azure, um, Rackspace, and everybody's kind of offering these, um, I guess, instance-based um, um, services for you to deploy. So this is when you get into something like um, at, into a TurboTax, 
where you know throughout the year nobody's using the TurboTax server, and then come on April you know fifteenth, um, you, you know you're getting sixty thousand submissions a minute. So, so um, they scale um, in these frameworks, um, and then scale back down when the, when the volume's not there. Um, so there are services. Um, the industry is tending to go away from that, but um, um, <laughs> there's a site called Ayura, um, A Y E R A. Um, they're in Modesto. Um, I know that they will host your own equipment, and there's a few others out there. Um, so CS5, Adobe just launched a product. Um, they offered a new service that supposedly does this. I haven't tried it yet. I just seen it in their kind of their press earlier this month. Um, I usually, personally, I just keep a copy of each of these installed, and then I switch every day. One day I'm IE, next day I'm Safari, next day I'm. Yeah. I think, um, again, Google, um, one of the, I think there's a link on there that, that talks a lot about the, um, um, the HTML specification, but there are sites that will tell you um, that IE6 will read this, um, this markup code this way, IE7 will do it this way. Um, I haven't found a good site that does it, that brings it all together, and it's a lot of, you know, back and forth. Yeah, I've, actually, I've heard of that. I haven't used it, but. Um. <laughs> okay, I'll turn it back over. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So, plant the site, architected it, designed it, launched it. Now this you know, beautiful work of art is sitting there, it's the day after. And I remember when every time we launch a site, and then suddenly, like every two hours, you're hitting your analytics service, are they there yet? Are they there yet? Are they there yet? And they're not. And how do you make sure that you drive traffic? That's obviously the big game. And again, you know, by definition, every startup starts out being unknown, or almost every startup starts out being unknown. So you start from ground zero, and then how do you build it up? Uh, blogging is a good way to, and there's again several services, there's tons of these out there. Blogging is a good way to drive traffic. It hinges on two things. One is you're commenting on other people's blogs, in particular famous bloggers. So if you go to, you know, some, you know, whatever, Bill Gates has his own blog and you, you know, respond very quickly to one of his uh, blogs. So you need to follow his or her blog. Make sure that you have a notification service. The minute they, their blog comes out, be one of the first ones to get your comment in. You know, it's, it's a full-time job. And then you know, they, they say, okay, well, you know, Paul made a nice comment, and I'm going to put it up here. Now people, and you obviously want to make sure that you have a link back to your own site or your own blog, and then you drive traffic back. Uh, that's one good way to drive traffic, but it's fairly time intensive, and it's real time, you know, because you need to get your comments up there as soon as possible. Um, similarly with uh, for most people, though, blogging is more or less online collateral. The good news is you don't have to spend the money on a print brochure anymore. The bad news is it's probably a good idea to maintain a blog just so that the people that are interested in your business and you give them a business card, 
They read what you have to say on certain opinions and, you know, once a week, every two weeks, make sure you have some fresh content up there, link it to other blogs, be cross-linked to those blogs. And by the way, the cross-links is what's driving traffic. That's how you get up in the search engine ranking. Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, uh, same with the other stuff then, the social networking links, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Again, by and large, 99% of the cases, it's online collateral. Make sure you have it available. Uh, it's unlikely that in and of itself drives uh, traffic uh, because, again, you're not any more known there than you are here. So just because you're on Facebook doesn't mean you get more traffic than you get for your own site. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, you know, we can skip the rest. I mean, this is basically going back and doing ongoing feedback and analysis and going out to people, you know, are you finding what you need, what you think of the site, do you really like it or not? and then collect that feedback and incorporate it. It's a d dynamic living thing. You have to constantly tune it and update it. So. Any, do we have time for questions or no, not? We have time for the next couple because we've done it. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.